Hello and welcome to Pubholic.org. I am Dr. Latasha Headley alongside my colleague, Dr. Indukaku Amalu. And we welcome you to our platform, um, which is op open, uh, evident open and evidence-based discussions regarding issues affecting our local and global communities. Always remember to keep up with your reliable source by signing up at pubholic.org, that's P-U-B-H-O-L-I-C, .org and follow us on Instagram at www.instagram.com forward slash Pupolic. For more information on how you can join the Pupolic family, we have placed it in the chat, so feel free to click and connect. This month is Mental Health Awareness Month, and this Sunday is also Mother's Day. So first, I would like to give a shout out to all the phenomenal moms out there, and we would like to wish you all a wonderful Mother's Day. With that said, our topic today is on social determinants of mental health as it affects the Black and African American population. This exciting presentation will be given by an organization well versed on this topic called Black Women Health Awareness Conference. And, and at the end of this dis discussion, they can be located at www.bwhwc.org, which is also um, located in the chat, and we encourage you to connect with them as well. We are honored to have owners, Ms. Chioko Grievous and Ms. Jessica Brown. But before we start, we would like to introduce these wonderful ladies. And I will now turn it over to Dr. Amelie. Thank you everyone for joining this uh, amazing discussion. Social determinants has a lot of factors. In this particular presentation, there's gonna be two social determinants that uh, this organization will be focusing on. Uh, that being said, uh, Chioko Grievous has over 12 years of public health experience, both in community health organizations and the state of public health department. Mrs. Grievous has worked in genetic disease, nutrition, HIV care, chronic diseases, and reproductive health. Mrs. Grievous provides innovative health intervention designed to improve equitable health care outcomes for Black indigenous people and other minority groups. She co-found the Black Women's Health Awareness Conference in 2014 with Jessica Brown. Black Women's Health Awareness Conference provide resources and promote Black women collaborative discussions on mental health and wellness to improve their quality of health. In the past six years, the conference has served 1,000 women at the in-person conference. Due to COVID-19, they continue to provide services via virtual platforms. Mrs. Grievous received her master's degree in public health in 2014, and will be graduating next week, May 21st, 2021, yeah, from the University of San Francisco with another master's degree in counseling psychology with emphasis in marriage and family therapy. Mrs. Grievous completed her internship at the Gender Health Center, providing direct therapeutic services and received a Sacramento Black Wellness Award for her contributions to Black and trans wellness. Recently, Mrs. Grievous received a public health acknowledging my effort called Fame Award in Public Service by the California Department of Public Health for her proactive contributions in improving culturally relevant approaches to public health intervention. Shoko, you are welcome. All right, so, <laughs> so it's now my turn to introduce uh, Ms. Jessica Brown. Uh, she has um, a master's in public health, which she attained from San Jose State University. Ms. Brown's primary expertise is in program implementation and evaluation, strategic planning development, operationalizing racial equity and workforce initiatives and community-based participatory research and administration. I won't say that three times fast. <laughs> With over 10 years of public health and behavioral health experience, Ms. Brown has worked in a variety of health services, such as genetic newborn screening, HIV prevention and surveillance, and community behavioral health. Ms. Brown has focused her career on closing the gap on health and racial inequities and is currently specializing in public and mental health program development and management. She currently works, I will, 
I call it two jobs. Um, uh, San Francisco Department of Public Health keeps her busy because she's an interim director as well as an acting director um, at uh, the Department of Public Health. Her various roles entail strategic planning, organization, implementation, and evaluation of equity and workforce programs, integrating racial equity frameworks, uh, policy, and managing various programs and projects, including cultural competency activities, American Diabetes Association-related activities, community-based, and employee relations. She also collaborates with community stakeholders to use racial equity frameworks to transform the public health and mental health sector. Ms. Brown also works with San Francisco Human Rights Commission's Office of Racial Equity and implementing the city's racial equity ordinance and serving on the Human Rights Commission Task Force to develop strategies on the reallocation of police funding into Black and African American communities throughout San Francisco. Ms. Brown has been committed to <clears throat> developing strategies to address health equities that drastically impact uh, Black and African American and Latin communities throughout the Northern California. She is dedicated to co comforting the impacts of racism and how it contributes to inadequate treatment, misdiagnosis, and undervaluing the trauma and pain of Black and African American communities. With that said, we welcome both Ms. Grievous and Ms. Brown. And before I go over the agenda for today, um, are there any comments that you would like to say at this time? No, we're just happy that you're having us. Thank you. Thank you so much for those beautiful introductions. Thank you, we appreciate you. So now I will discuss the agenda for today. Let me go to the next slide. Okay, so the agenda for today, again, today's topic, again, is, is on the social determinants of mental health as it affects the Black and African American population. And during today's discussion, um, we will cover the following by our presenters, um, which are social determinants and mental health uh, definitions. Uh, they will go over, they will go over social determinants of mental health as um, racism, abusive relationships, medical health system and mental health effects on mental health, um, some best practices and solutions um, in regards to reform medical and, and public health. And then they will summarize for us. And then we will open the floor and invite all guests to engage with us in a healthy discussion. Um, we do ask uh, everyone kindly mute yourself if you're not speaking so that we can make sure there are no background interruptions uh, during this broadcast. Okay. With that said, we will go into our first question. Uh, Ms. Grievous or Ms. Brown, can you um, define, um, go over uh, with us some definition of social determinants and mental health? Yes, thank you so much. Um, so uh, what social determinants, you know, for me, uh, what they really look at are what are some factors that impact someone's ability to have optimal health. And so looking at things such as not just access to health care, but also where someone lives, um, looking at things like economic stability, um, you know, community and social context. So really, how are we socially connected to our community and how uh, that community in, in informs us of our cultural norms and, and how we access health. Looking at food, um, you know, ensuring that someone has access to food and not just living in um, areas where there's food deserts or food insecurity and really having access to, to education. And so these are things that, um, you know, for, for us as public health professionals, we look at holistically what's impacting somebody's ability to access healthcare and have a quality optimal life. And it's the social determinants, you know, we no, we no longer are looking at individual, um, you know, behavioral choices. I mean, that's a very small factor when it comes to these things, but looking at holistically what's been happening in that person's environment um, to impact them, right? So it's, it's different than you know, if a person comes into a, a medical setting and, and talking to their provider and saying, uh, you know, I have diabetes and that provider provides them some treatment um, and that person's diabetes is managed, that's great for a, a medical professional. But however, what's impacting that person's environment outside of the hospital setting to like to help to impact them managing their diabetes? Is it access to food, education, stress? Um, and then I'm going to pass on to Yoko, but one of the other social determinants of health that I would say that typically is not talked about enough, enough is the impact of racism. 
I know the CDC has announced that racism is a public health issue, um, and that's very fairly new based off of the George Floyd uh, murder uh, and everything that's been happening in, in the COVID pandemic. But racism has always been a factor in impacting all of these components that you're seeing on the screen. Uh, and I think it needs to be talked about a, a, a lot more than what we do and uh, what we have done as public health professionals. And so we will definitely get into the ways that racism, um, oppression can impact economic stability, neighborhood and physical environment um, and education. I'll pass it on to you. Yeah, so thank you, Jess. I, it's very interesting that Jessica, of course, went in beautifully about social determinants of health and her and I have had discussions about just the idea of, you know, we, we, a lot of us public health professionals, we understand that there are these social determinants that are environmental and emotional. And it's kind of like, what is, what are we going to do about it? Because at this point, um, I think our, our powers that be our government are making a, a conscious choice to keep these things at play. And so it's like, are we going to still lean with social determinants or now is it becoming a moral determinants of health? So um, I, I'm always blown away by the fact that we still have those factors at play. So this um, slide is health equity and health equity is defined as the absence of unfair and avoidable or, re or remediable differences in health among population groups defined socially, economically, demographically, or geography, ge geographically, sorry. Um, so there's, a, there's equity, which is for all, like everyone has an equal shot. And then there's equality where you're offering, you're offering the same thing for, to everyone. But equity is really about making sure that everyone has the exact same access to quality healthcare, comprehensive healthcare, and not just presenting it. And that's, that's equality where we all have health insurance. There's the Affordable Care Act. Um, we all have these opportunities to get into um, Medicaid programs, but the equity piece is making sure that all of those things meet people where they're at so that everyone has an equal shot to be healthy and thrive. Jessica? Um, and so uh, thank you, Chiyoko, for leading into that very beautifully. Um, so when it comes to like mental health and behavioral health equity, um, we're looking at behavioral health equity as really as someone having the, um, the right to access quality mental health care for all populations. And this is regardless of race and ethnicity um, and really including access to prevention, treatment, recovery and uh, mental health and substance use uh, disorder. And so really just thinking about doing whatever it takes to get a client mentally from recovery to wellness. So how do we transition someone from um, having to go into like intense case management from you know mental health cons uh, uh, adverse conditions into now going into outpatient care where they can you know continue to live their lives as they probably were um, before having this, um, this, uh, this adverse uh, mental health outcome. Um, and so when we're thinking about mental health, it's really just thinking about, you know, um, how, how to, again, get someone to optimal health so where they can manage stress, um, where they are able to cope, um, even with, you know, maybe suffering with depression, normalizing, you know, mental health conditions amongst all communities, and really also having uh, practices that are culturally relevant to the communities that we're serving. Uh, oftentimes we use a very westernized uh, treatment modality for mental health um, you know, concerns, but they need to be tailored to the, the population and what the population um, needs or the community needs. And also that's, this helps with reducing stigma, which is why we're looking at what behavioral health equity is. So just also having access to you know, quality mental health care, but also having culturally relevant um, uh, care, and that's e including even our workforce, making sure that we have more Black and Latinx therapists um, in the mental health field to really be able to serve these, uh, serve the communities that are mostly marginalized and often forgotten. I'll pass it to Shiyoko. So this um, next slide is about how are we achieving health and mental health equity at every single level? And so there's this idea of uh, our healthy society, and there's a healthy environment, which is what our quality of our, of our environment is. So if you're living next to freeways, your quality of life is going to be completely different from someone who is not living next to those freeways or 
my favorite place is the Bay Area, but there's a difference of kids who are growing up in West Oakland versus kids who are growing up in Berkeley, which is just basically across the railroad tracks, right? So in West Oakland, there are um, plants and um, train tracks and freeways that run over them. And those kids have a, a big problem with asthma and um, Children's Hospital of Oakland are, are seeing so many kids um, who are battling and dying from asthmatic um, symptoms, whereas there are other kids in the Bay Area who do not have that because they don't have freeways um, running over their heads or they don't have um, uh, these factories and plants and naval shipyards that are right next door. So that's our environmental quality. Then we have discrimination and minority stressors. And those are things like, you know, at work or just not being treated fairly. Um, housing is our healthy environment and our community. Um, neighborhood, is, if it's safe, is it walkable? Um, are there safe parks to go to? Um, there's the food security and nutrition. There's income security. So what jobs are available? There's class. So the culturally ling linguistically appropriate and competent services. So when you're going to those doctor offices, um, are they meeting you where you're at as far as your readability and your ability to com comprehend or understand or converse in the way that makes the most sense to you? Um, child development, education, literacy rates, you know, are, are our kids being educated equitably like other kids, like our counterparts' kids? So other white children, are, are our kids getting the same opportunity um, to, to learn and thrive in those environments? There is mental health services, are those equitable, preventative care, health care. Um, so if we're able to transform these conditions, um, we are going to get to a place where there is optimal health and mental health and well-being for everyone. Um, but we're always, I always hear like, especially at work in meetings about, oh, you know, we can't get Black people or people of color to take COVID vaccines. We can't, they're not, you know, maintain their um, diabetes, le diabetes levels and their hypertension, but no one ever stops and talks about why those things are. So why are there not safe housing for folks? And the honest truth is that these things have been designed for us here in the States. Um, so we need to definitely look at that a little bit deeper um, and start holding folks accountable. Yes. All right. So just getting into, and I, I did that side because this, you know, just what um, uh, Chioko is talking about, all of these things are, are impacted by, you know, race, uh, power, and privilege. And so just kind of giving you all some definitions. And I actually took some of these definitions from Dr. Um, Ibram Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, um, to really just talk about, you know, what the definitions look like. I thought his definitions were a lot more um, concrete and really show how um, policies, racist ideas have really impacted our ability to have uh, equity amongst all of our all of our different communities. So just real quickly going over, you know, race, a power construct, uh, collected and merged differences that lives uh, socially, ethnicity, looking at culturally defined differences between ethnic groups, uh, power, the ability to act and produce uh, an effect in possession of control, authority, and influence over others. And then privilege, power and advantage is benefiting from um, a social group. Um, uh, and this is, you know, based off a of historical impression of uh, uh, oppression and exploitation of, uh, of other groups as well. And these are the things that, you know, when Chioka was listing out all of those, the, the different ways uh, that we can have health equity, I, I personally can see where racism has impacted each one of those concepts uh, from not having culturally con congruent and linguistic uh, care, um, looking at our housing, you know, most of our populations that are unhoused are, are Black African American identified, especially here in the Bay Area. Uh, looking at education, we know the statistics of how um, Black children are um, performing and actually uh, criminalized in the school system. And so all of these things really impact our ability and also our mental health. Um, and, you know, it's just important to really define um, where we've all gotten these concepts and how race race is basically a social construct um, really created to continue and justify the oppression of Black African Americans and uh, the genocide of Native Americans as well. Uh, next slide. 
Okay, so racism is defined as a belief that race is the primary determinant of human traits and, cap and capacities that the racial difference produce an inherent superiority of a particular race. It is well documented that race is a factor in health disparities that is not moderated by age, sex, and level of education. Virtually every factor considered in this document is impacted by racism or in this in this um, presentation. For Black Americans in the United States, racism is a systemic, organized, social and cultural phenomenon that through exclusion, prejudice and discrimination is a cause of social and health disparities that are manis manifested as factors that affect our health for which measurements cannot always be defined um, that cannot always be defined. So individually, racism exerts its power and effects through negative cognitive and emotional phenomenal, phenomena, sorry, leading to psychopathology and morbidity. Um, and so we always, we hear racism a lot and we hear that things are racist, but it is truly s s powers at B, right? That are continuously organizing and um and just it, it's a structure so yeah jess next slide thank you so just looking at the systems of racism um you know we also oftentimes we interchange the world structural structural and institutionalized racism um but just really just breaking it down when we think about social uh, structural racism it's a macro level system social forces institution ideologies processes that interact with one another to generate inequities among racial, uh, racial and ethnic groups. Institutionalized racism is really within the institution. So within our government system, um, looking at uh, discriminatory treatment, unfair policies and practices, um, how is that institution really practicing structural racism and utilizing racist ideas, racist policies to further um, you know, uh, cause a divide um, for certain groups. Uh, and then looking at interpersonal racism, which really occurs between individuals, so bringing our own private beliefs um, into uh, interactions with others. Uh, there's always the saying, you know, and I actually have a pet peeve with it. Uh, everyone could be biased, and why that? Why that's true? That is true that people can buy, be biased. There are certain biases that would impact me as a Black African American woman more than they will somebody else, right? So um, when I think about, like, for example. Uh, labeling black women as angry black women. In the workplace, that can be very harmful because it doesn't allow us to be human. It doesn't allow us to make mistakes. And anytime that we're firm or assertive, it gets turned around to, oh, she's being aggressive, she's being hostile. And that's where those types of beliefs can impact our livelihood and our ability to maintain employment. Uh, so it's a little bit different when people are saying everyone can be biased, that's very true, but the biases have a, a very uh, level um, as people say, there's levels to this on how it really impacts you. And so this is where the interpersonal interactions can also bring out those biases and those racist ideology. And then internalized racism um, really looks into within ourselves and um, you know how someone is looking at the, the system, the structures, ideas, and they're actually internalizing this. I mean, for we're gonna go into some really deep, um, uh, history of what's happened in the medical field and, and also with the mental health. Um, and the goal of that is to not only provide people with knowledge, but to also provide people with not internalizing the racist treatment that they've been facing in the health system. I mean, we will see why we have such high rates of maternal mortality rates amongst Black African American women. And it's going to be because of these racist ideas that have been kind of throughout the these 400 plus years on Black women and then their ability to take pain, their ability to um, not be heard, uh, and all of these factors that really impact our health. And so oftentimes when Chioka and I are, are talking with clients or we're serving women at our conference, we hear a lot of internalized racism on, you know, you know why they're not being served and giving access to quality medical care that is not their fault. <laughs> so we'll go into, you know, more about why it's really important to know our history, really important to understand the background of how these, these ideologies were shaped and how to not internalize racist ideas that then lead to uh, mistreatment and abuse. 
Yeah, thanks, Jessica. So racial discrimination. So this comes from the book How to Be an Anti-Racist um, by Dr. Kindy, which is which is a really great book. Um, not maybe for African Americans because that's not us, but it's good for everybody. Um, so racial discrimination is an immediate and visible manifestation of an underlying racial policy. We all have the power to discriminate. Next slide. Oh, one more. So this is just racial equity. And so when we're talking about equity, which, all, which happens a lot right now, because this seems to be a trend, um, what we are talking about is racial equity. So there's a difference between looking at, you know, someone having access to care, that would be more health equity. But when we're thinking about racial equity, we're looking at the systems, policies, racial ide uh, ideologies that have been in place to really work to um, continue these inequities and cause them. So not just looking at, um, you know, well, somebody's neighborhood where they're living at, that's going to impact their ability to access care. Um, while that is true, what are the reasons why that person is in that neighborhood? What are some of the factors that are causing, as Shioko mentioned, the majority of Black identified um, communities and families in West Oakland to have to live in a polluted industrial environment. Um, what's What has happened there um, to where that factors uh, takes place to where we are seeing these inequities. And so, you know, as Chioko beautifully said, you know, we really wanna look at moral determinants of health. And this is where the racial equity takes place in because it really unpacks what's happening, what systematically that impacts our ability for people to have quality access to care. Is it how providers are treating their patients? Is it how, um, you know, in mental health field, many white providers were di misdiagnosing their black clients with uh, schizophrenia and bipolar depression, bipolar depression, when really a lot of our uh, black fam uh, communities have post-traumatic stress disorder or, or anxiety and depression. And so looking at why um, a provider, a mental health provider would misdiagnose someone and looking at what are the racist ideas that are happening with that mental health provider um, to do that, even with our, our primary physicians as well. So this is what racial equity looks like to me. And I actually like this word a lot better than equity because it, it really impacts the systematic and the history on why we are seeing this equity versus just saying, oh, we just need to give people access to care. Yes, that is true. But it's the type of quality care that they're getting and making sure that there's enough providers that reflect the community and also can provide culturally relevant practices, you know, and really be able to help clients or our patients develop a treatment plan that meets them where they're at versus this westernized ideology that I'm the provider, I know more than you, you need to follow what I'm, what I'm saying, right? And that's, that's typically how our healthcare system has gone. Yeah, um, this is amazing information you provided. And uh, it's amazing. I believe that every single word you guys have provided here, everything we've seen in the society is actually social construct. And it is about time in the 21st century to start reframing the social construct to be able to uh, have that racial equity and health equity that you guys are talking about. So now that you have provided us with this operational definition and construct of social determinants that influence or that can influence health outcomes. Uh, medical and public health systems are definitely part of the social determinants. Can you unpack and describe some of the relationships in medical systems and public health on mental health? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take it away. Um, you know. Really, when I've been looking at this, and I, you know, been doing Chiyo and I, we we've been in this field for a while, just kind of unpacking why these things are. As I mentioned to you, when I look at the timeline of Black African Americans in our history in in this country, um, to me, it's no wonder why we still have these health inequities, right? When we look at this timeline here, we've been through enslavement, Reconstruction, Jim Crow, Civil Rights Movement, all to to mass incarceration. And, you know, when we, we talk about the history of Black African Americans, you know, some will say, well, we've made progress, you know, because we've had more Black doctors, we have um, Beyonce, we have, you know, all of these celebrities that are making billion, being billionaires. Um, and while that is a, a, 
a performative show of progress. What we failed to understand is that in 1964, when the Civil Rights Act was passed, it, it did help with liberate and provide us with civil rights, but it did not pay any reparations for the 400 plus years. There was nothing involved in that act to help us with economic stability, to close the wealth gap, to also to ensure that our that our teachers were in these integrated schools, as you all know, that in 1954 the uh, Brown versus Board, Board of Education uh, to you know dismantle segregation, it only did that for students. It didn't do that for the teachers and the principals. And so when we have these educational gaps um, for for Black students, it's because you know we have had a long abuse of the history of only seeing whiteness as a form of power and and right. And so that spills over into our medical system as well, well too, and I'll go into that more. But if you look at this particular slide, like we, we have been stamped from the beginning of since coming here in 1916, I'm sorry, 19, uh, 1619. And there have been several laws. Um, I would say there's probably over 150 uh, local, state, federal laws against Black African Americans in this country that has hap not happened to any other group. It's been Native Americans and Black African, Amer Black African Americans, but particularly as far as who is in enslaved and who is free, it's been against Black African Americans. And so when we understand these laws, yes, a 1964 Civil Rights Act was beautiful to be passed, but without the reparations to make up for the lack of generational wealth, the gap in education, uh, the abuse in the medical uh, system and the overly um, criminalized and incarcerated uh, of, of black black men, black women, black children, that that Civil Rights Act doesn't hold as much weight as we think it would, right? Because we are now trying to pay, ca play catch up with a 400 year, um, while we're at the starting line 400 years ago, you know, white people have had, uh, I, I like to say, affirmative action for the last 400 years. <laughs> And, and so we have really tried to, when you think about that and how that spills into our health system, it's very uh, apparent that this, this, this timeline for us is still very relevant. Um, next slide. Okay, so we're going to talk about our race's introduction into the medical system. And so um, there is an amazing book um, called Medical Apartheid it's by Harriet Washington. And you all probably have, have heard of this book, uh, Dr. Harriet Washington, excuse me, where she really unpacks all of the mistreatment in the medical system, the way that Black bodies have been experimented on, um, you know, the way that medical advancement um, has happened based off of the enslavement of Black African American people. Uh, and so she puts this down, um, enslavement could not have existed and certainly could not have persisted without medical science. The slave owner and the physician shared an interest in the slave's health. And this is really, this really hit me because when I think about slavery, I had to think about how did Black African Americans survived. Like the conditions in, in enslavement during those times um, were horrid. You know, there were diseases, there were uh, living conditions, uh, were, were um, terrible for enslaved people, of course. Um, and the reason why they survived is there were medical doctors and physicians helping taking care of them and ensuring that uh, they were able to work. Um, and that was just really hard hitting to me and, and really made me think about no wonder why we have this fear of doctors. Like it's not that black people don't want to get health care and don't want to see uh, mental health professionals. There has been an abusive relationship that's been established since enslavement that's been passed down from generations to generations to generations. Um, and so uh, this really was eye opening to me and really helped me as a public health professional not be so judgmental on when somebody is not wanting to get care, like we have right now, folks that don't want to get vaccinated. Um, while you know, I do believe in the science, I understand why someone would be hesitant, right, and not trusting of this. Um, and so we'll we'll talk more about why that is, but it just this was really hard hitting for me seeing this and reading this book. It really put into perspective why we're at where we are today. Uh, next slide. Probably need to get through these fast. Okay, so when we talk about medical participation, 
um, you know, doctors were paid to inspect slaves and enslave people and really just to make sure when they were taken from the slave ship, um, they would inspect them to make sure that they were, you know, healthy and that they were able to work and be laborers. Um, you know, there was a passage of the Dublin Act, which mandated that all English slave ships had a doctor on board. Um, you know, and the doctors were heavily compensated with either money or enslaved people for their inspections. Um, and doctors would participate in inspections of enslaved people and in auctions as well, too. So during the auctions, they would be inspecting them. Uh, and they really thought that were um, responsible for establishing soundness. Um, and I, I want to ask you all what that means. What you all, when you hear soundness, what does that mean for you? Maybe you can put it in the chat because I know we don't, don't want to mess up the program. But if you put in the chat what you think soundness is, when I thought about soundness, I was like, oh, does that mean, you know, making sure that they're competent or that they are um, able to, I don't know, work hard? Really what soundness meant, particularly for Black African American women, was to ensure that they were attractive and that they could give birth, that they had, they had reproductive health. And this was their attempt to utilize the medical system to ensure that Black African American enslaved women were uh, sound for slave owners to rape them and to also help them mass produce and reproduce children um, that they can in, and then enslave to continue that economic self-interest. So the doctors, um, physicians took part in this and this basically expanding slavery, keeping it ongoing and ensuring that slaves were healthy enough um, to work. Uh, next slide, please. So the care of enslaved people. So as I mentioned to you, doctors were used during the inspection um, and on the slave ships. However, uh, when doctors, when enslaved people were actually in, you know, in the plantations, Plantation owners would not want to call the doctors when, when slaves were, sl were sick. Reason why? Because they felt like it was too expensive. So what they would do is they would say, when, a, when let's say an enslaved person said, I'm, I'm sick, I'm not feeling well, I can't work. They would say, you're lying. And uh, there would be harsh punishment for a, an enslaved person showing any, any, any sickness, any weakness. The only time a doctor was called was when someone was really on like their deathbed. Then that, then that person would actually go and um, at that, that owner, the enslaved owner, would uh, call a physician in. But with the majority, um, enslaved African people had to use uh, traditional methods for recovery, um, looking at you know, their ancestral practices in order to really help with you know, recovery of any type of condition. There also were slave hospitals. And these slave hospitals, were really used to experiment on um, enslaved people. And so a lot of times enslaved people would not want to go to the hospital because they would be, they would be used to be experimented on um, by medical physicians. Um, there's also two, um, this is where we see black midwives um, who in owners, uh, um, plantation owners or enslaved owners utilize black midwives to help with um, birthing children but did not respect them as actual medical professionals. Like there was a, a, a book in the Dr. Harriet's uh, Washington's book. She mentions how white physicians um, who had less education, less experience would question the practices of black midwives, uh, even though they were not, you know, um, you know, experienced or well-versed enough to even question the abilities of these midwives who have been practicing this um, probably before their enslavement. In addition to um, enslaved um, people, um, the owners would take out life insurance policies on them because there was there was money involved in a slave's uh, enslaved person's death, and so this is where we see a lot of rise to some of our life insurance companies that we have now, New York Life, um, who really participated in the slave trade uh, and the and enslavement uh, and provided policies for slave owners to, that they can take out on their on their enslaved um, slave folks. Next slide, please. Um, in addition to that, um, you know, we have a lot of experimentation on, on Black women. Um, you know, uh, we have, uh, this is where the father of, of uh, LBGYN has emerged. Um, Jay Simmons, he experimented on one of his enslaved 
um, uh, black women over 150 times without any anesthesia. And this part, this picture looks very nice. Like it looks like she's saying, oh yeah, you know, look at me, examine me. But this is probably more horrid than what this picture depict, depicts. I'm sure this woman was held down probably by other enslaved people, probably other, you know, enslaved black men while this doctor performed all these different surgeries on this woman in her reproductive system area. Next slide. Oh, well, go back. Uh, there we go. Uh, also to the abuse of black bodies. Um, we see that, um, you know, enslaved black bodies are used to practice anatomy and various procedures for medical students. There's grave robbing where they're digging up bodies from enslaved people to take them to medical school, um, to being shipped to medical school so they can utilize them. There's just all this experimentation that's happening on black bodies for the, for the, the uh, plight of medical advancement. Uh, next slide. And so where this all comes from and, and why this has happened, it's not only just the enslavement that's happening, but it's this racist ideas, racist policy that normalizes and justifies racism against Black African Americans and the abuse of them in our medical system. Um, so if you all see this, where I'm showing you the, the, the slave, uh, slave in law in Virginia and the growth population, as you all see, like um, after 1625, we see an exponential growth in enslaved people in Virginia. And I'll show you the reasons on why that's happening in, in the next slide. So before we get there, we'll talk about racist ideas. Um, so we have, and I'm going to say his na name all wrong, but you know, he doesn't really deserve much of it, <laughs> much credit, but Gomez um, Zerara uh, is really credited for writing the first um, uh, recorded anti-Black racism idea. Um, and basically in, in his Chronicle of Discovery in uh, 1453, he basically was trying to um, justify the enslavement uh, of the Portuguese slave trade under Prince Harry. And what he would do is he would basically describe captives as uh, black and ugly, black race was lost, living with beasts, no cu customs, and no understanding of, of goods. Um, and this is this is like the first ideology of where this this idea to justify the enslavement of of of, of black I'm sorry Africans in this time period. Uh, next slide. And then we have um, Carl Littness, uh, the taxonomy, sorry, I forgot, I forgot a slide. Um, but basically, this is where he chronicalizes, um, you know, how we um, classify race. So we have the Amer Americanas, which are the Native American. They're unyielding, cheerful, paint him, paints himself in a maze with red lines, governed by customary rights. We have Europeans, um, light, wise inventors, uh, governed by rights, um, Asiatic, uh, stern, haughty, greedy, um, uh, governed by opinions, and then African, Africans, sly, sluggish, neglectful, uh, governed by choice. And so this is where these, these ideologies are starting to come into play. You know, we also have Darwinism um, to really kind of hold in on, you know, why we should be enslaving um, the uh, Black Africans, um, Black African, Black Africans during that time. Uh, next slide. Okay, we also have some religious theory. So we have the biological, you know, the rate and, and biological racism. Um, and so we have um, the curse theory, which has two basically different, um, you know, uh, creation stories. Uh, and basically, you know, um, uh, black people are cursed by God. And this is the reason for their enslavement. We also have uh, polygenesis, which, ha which has different creation stories, um, and also saying that, you know, there was a, a different creation or a different creator for Black people. Uh, looking at Charles Darwin, is a Darwin, the origin of species, so he was using a natural selection theory as a way to say that uh, the white race was the winning race um, and that there, the outcomes for the weaker races were extinction, slavery, or assimilation. And so what was fascinating about, not even fascinating, what was appalling about this was that um, what he described is that the in instinction would be for Native Americans, slavery would be for Black African Americans, and then assimilation would be for Asian identified folks. 
And we see that that assimilation and that division amongst people of color today. And so this is their way, their way of um, perpetuating that was from these, this biological and religious racism that we're seeing. Next slide. Okay, so um, the impacts of racist ideas, and I think I missed the slide, but um, as you all were seeing uh, the, the, the growth of the slave population back in uh, 1625, um, there were really some laws that were put into place. So all of these ideas uh, about how black people are undeserving and sluggish, and you know, basically they need to be enslaved also um, helped um, bring about these laws. So we, so we have in um, 1662, we have, um, you know, uh, the condition of uh, so uh, if a child if the mother um, had a child an enslaved black woman if she had a child and maybe the father was the slave owner um, or you know someone you know because there was a time when we actually were around other indigenous servant servants from other different you know European countries but basically um, that that child would have to be um, enslaved based on the condition of the mother. So what happened with when they're in that time period is there were, there were a lot of people, um, a lot of enslaved people actually gaining their freedom because there were these laws in place saying that you have to be Christian or you have to be um, uh, your, uh, there was another one about your your father being an Englishman or be, you have to be an Englishman. And, you know, it was a way to start distinguishing um, indentured servants and enslaved people. But what was happening is that, for example, Elizabeth Keys, she was someone who was an enslaved person, um, but her father was was white. Uh, and then she ended up meeting a, an indentured servant um, who was actually studying to be a lawyer to help her get her freedom based off of the con you know, condition that she is Christian, she's Christian or she uh, also has an English uh, father. So they ended up changing the laws to now start just in, again, distinguishing race um, dividing us from indentured servants, and then also to putting all these stipulations to not only justify the um, the uh, the rape and the uh, a black and violation of black women by now saying that your child is going to be basically enslaved, but also to like no longer these conditions. You know, even if you're a Christian, you and you're uh, enslaved or you're black, you have to be a slave for life. You know, we have John Punch, who was, um, you know, one of the um, uh, uh, enslaved person who ran away with two indentured servants. servants. Uh, once they were captured, they actually sentenced John Punch to be an enslaved for life, while his indentured servants, uh, folks that he ran away with, got to serve a certain amount of time and they were free. So this is where we started to see, see this divide in looking at, um, you know, how race is, was basically created, justified by these racist ideas. And so, you know, taking us back, we have, you know, after, you know, enslavement, we also have all of these different, um, and the civil, you know, the civil war happened and, you know, um, black African-Americans were free. We now have these Jim Crow laws that are in place uh, where there's segregated hospitals and few facilities where black people can go. And basically those, those facilities would have long wait times. And the only way that someone can get care is if they consented to being experimented on. Uh, and then we have, you know, as you all probably know, the Tuskegee's experiment, which went on for 40 plus years. Um, we have untreated syphilis in Guatemala prisons, Henry Reddit Henry Lacks, uh, the Pill Study, and the National Research uh, Act established as well, too. So that that was established based off of all of these, uh, these terrible experiments that were happening to Black African American people. Uh, next slide. Then we have the eugenics movement in the 1920s, which basically justified the sterilization of unfit communities. Um, you know, looking at North Carolina eugenics um, uh, commission, also the Mississippi uh, appendectomy, uh, where they were taking black women who were going in for just normal, you know, services or like having their appendix moved, removed, and next thing you know, they're waking up and their uterus is gone. Um, so kind of do, doing these four sterilized um, uh, sterilization programs on communities of color and also looking at how the government actually played a role into pushing the eugenics movement as well. Uh, next slide. 
Okay. And so with all of that that has happened, you know, this is looking at the landscape of a Black African American. So when we are uh, talking about health disparities, there's, there's this, these are the reasons why. So we have reasons why, you know, um, Black African Americans are most likely, three times more likely to die from asthma related causes than non white, uh, white, non Hispanic white populations, as Shiyoko mentioned earlier. You know, it's looking at how um, even, in, even in enslavement times, there was a there were some social determinants of health, right? And Dr. B uh, Henrietta uh, Washington's book, she talks about how um, the enslaved population lived in very horrid conditions where there was disease, um, there were you know the high you know uh, germs. There were just a terrible condition for the enslaved people to live in, while their slave owners or other white people lived in very beautiful you know areas and didn't have as many health concerns or conditions as the enslaved population. That's very that mirrors exactly what we're seeing today when it comes to black health. Um, we see us having more in health and equities, more health disparities than our white compared to our white counterparts. Um, and so this is where this is where all of this comes into, you know, especially when it gets into mental health, suicide being the second leading cause of death for Black African American people ages 15 to 24, uh, Black women suffering from fibroids, um, Black women having three or, or three times the maternal mortality rate than white women, um, and this is this is in today's. This is not in the 1950s. This is in you know 2017 is where a lot of this data came from. Um, okay, next slide. Oh, okay. And so with all of that, that really impacts, um, you know, how we, where we are at today. And um, I want to go ahead and pass it on to Chioko. Okay, so thank you, Jessica. Wow, I just, I could feel my blood pressure rising. <laughs> thank you, uh, Jessica, for this. This is amazing. Everything you just showed, especially that last slide, it reminds me of Newton's law of motion. To every action, there's equal and opposite reaction. So we will always know that that's in physics, and that is also apparent in social construct, right? So thank you so much for this slide and uh, all the information you provided. Here in, in Popholic, we are open to evidence-based approaches on public health issues affecting local and global communities. In the process, we provide substantiated information and practical approaches to address public health issues to promote health, this healthy discussion, healthy people, and healthy environment. It is very obvious that racism and medical malfeasance environment, which are the key social determinants of interest in this discussion adversely influence mental health, especially among Black and African American. What can you tell us about the dark side of the mental trauma associated with these social determinants? And how can our society or environment move forward in, in the healing process? Okay, thank you. Um, those are great questions. So there are, there's this history of mental illness treatment amongst Black and African Americans that is is dark, right? So <clears throat> we we have this thing, you know, as a mental so as a public health practitioner, and then now as a mental health clinician, there are these things that mirror one another, right? So um, we, as a clinician, I'll hear a lot about you know, um, Black people not wanting to go to therapy, not wanting to receive a diagnosis. And our history shows us that there's no secret on why that would be the case. So African Americans were victimized by psychosurgery um, from the early 1930s to the 1960s. Um, there was a process of surgically removing parts of the brain, which is lobotomy, lobotomies to treat mental illnesses. So lobotomies were performed on black children as young as five years old who exhibited aggressive or hyperactive behaviors. And so um, one of the jobs, <laughs> since I have like a zillion of them, which um, was working with children on the spectrum, black, black families who have children on the autism spectrum. And I have a 13 year old who has been diagnosed with autism when he was four. And I remember 
remember people in my in my own family being like, oh no, 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 don't don't give that label. You know, that's that's something he'll grow out of. And it's this fear of, you know, your kid will be used to um your kid will be used in ways and and labeled in ways that haven't been favorable. So it keeps a lot of families, parents um, from getting their children uh, mental health services when they are needed. Um, but it is because of things like this dark history that we have with mental illness treatment. Next slide, please. So there is um, the discrimination and racism in the history of mental care is um, in about 1851, Cartwright, uh, Dr. Cartwright published a report where, um, I don't even know if he was a doctor, Samuel Cartwright, we'll just say that. Samuel Cartwright published a report where he invented these two psych psychiatric disorders, right? And it sounds, they sound like things that you'd make up if you want to stay home to be sick. So um, the first one is drapnomania, drapnomania, yeah. And um, dysathesis anesthesia um, atho Athopica, I think that's Athopica. I think that's yeah, Athopica. Sorry, to explain the tendencies of enslaved people um, to run away or to resist hard work as a mental illness. So there was this person who invented these disorders that um, supposedly enslaved people would have when they wanted to run. So that put a label on people who were treated unfairly, right? Were they resisting this hard work or running away? Um, Cartwright also explained that enslaved people demonstrated childlike simplicity and lack of complex emotional processes, which were characteristics of their entire race. Hospital superintendents used these ideas to justify a lack of any real therapeutic treatments for African American patients. This led to a dual system in many hospitals where Black patients were kept in separate substandard facilities and put to work in the hospital laundry, kitchen, and fields. Um, Samuel Cartwright, who was a pro-slavery physician who, and worked with enslaved people in Louisiana, argued that severe whipping was the typically the best treatment for both conditions. So those conditions that I mentioned earlier, if you were to whip slaves, that was the best treatment. And it advised slave owners to Whip, to beat them, um, to get them out of these mental illnesses that they were quote unquote claimed to have. Cartwright and others often reported that those, those psychiatric um, disorders that they invented were often accompanied by skin lesions, which historians now will argue that those scars were from whippings. So it's like, it's raining outside and you know, you're like, it's raining and somebody else is telling you that it's not when you know it's raining. So the idea that people got lesions on their skin from being whipped, they were told that that's because you wanted to run away. It's just, it's bizarre. So these physicians would fail to recognize the connection between the emotional state of enslaved people and the treatment they recommended for their condition. So most pre-Civil War mental health facilities in the South usually barred the enslaved from treatment. So apparently mental health experts believe that housing Blacks and whites in the same facilities would affect the healing of white people. Housing conditions in Southern asylums for the few that accepted the enslaved were bad enough for white patients, but the Blacks were often housed outdoors near these institutions or in local jails. There were accounts of some child slaves being cared for in the yards of the asylums. Most of these facilities were run without government funding or oversight and inmates as the children were called were regularly misdiagnosed and wrongfully accused of crimes, extending their stay in these institutions and exposing them to additional mistreatment by authorities. Many of these children were subjected to hard manual labor on farms owned by or near these institutions foreshadowing the notorious convict leasing systems that sprang up across the Reconstruction era South. And I'm sure that all of us can think of 
what that looks like now in 2021 with the idea of these for-profit prisons that have popped up everywhere to continuously slaving, enslaving Black people to do manual labor on farms for free. Next slide, please. So, um, Doc, is there a slide that is about the impacts of COVID-19 and mental health? Do you have that? Yeah, okay. So the coronavirus, so COVID-19, which we've all been dealing with for the past year and some change, um, the pandemic has revealed deep-seated inequities in healthcare for communities of color, and it amplifies the social and economic factors that contribute to poor health outcomes. So what I've been seeing is they're going to start pretty soon, I think, labeling as the impact, the mental health impacts of COVID-19 as being a form of PTSD. So the fact that our lives were shaken up um, and a new way of life had to happen within a couple of days, people have been really struggling um, mentally with this idea of a pandemic. And also, if you notice that COVID attacks everyone, but who has been the groups of people that have been dying at faster rates or dying more often from COVID? It's been Black, African Americans, and people of color. And that is because our, our sometimes our housing is substandard. We couldn't shelter in place. We have, sometimes we're a multi-generational household. Who are the people who are working in on front line or the essential workers? So the bus drivers, the people in stores. So a lot of us have been fortunate, including myself, to be able to shelter in place and my job is been able to work home. But there are people who are like my brother who deliver mail and people like an uncle that drives this, like drives buses that have not been able to shelter in place because they are deemed as essential workers and they are more likely to get COVID COVID than anyone else. Um, and that's the privilege that some of us have. Um, and that is why many people are dying and getting sick that are Black of COVID. So in the United States, 13% we make up 13% of the total US population. Um, and that was according to the Census Bureau in 2018. It doesn't seem like it because it's we're, we've been at 13% been at for years now. So I don't know. But um, anyways, we make up 30% of all COVID-19 cases. Latinos or Latinx folks who make up 18% of the population, they account for 17% of COVID-19 cases. So hospital rates due to COVID-19 disproportionately affect Black African-Americans. Black and, Black and African-Americans and Latinx or Latinos have sub substantially, they have lower access to mental health and substance use treatment services. And Black African-Americans and Latinx, Latinos have limited access to prevention, treatment, and recovery services. Um, and then also the same group of folks, Black African Americans have experienced the greatest increase in rate for overdose, for overdose deaths from non-methadone synthetic opioids due to COVID um, treatment. Next slide, please. So racism as a social process. So the upheavals of the post-World War II period made plain um, that there were these racial classifications and racism in our country. While research on new racism and implicit biases documents the changing content, character, and impl implications of new forms of racism, other research takes to identify or seeks to identify and explain the social processes and actors that account for change and persistence in racism. So researchers look at racism in two folds. There's racism in historical context, focusing on general mechanisms that account for macro level changes over time. And then there's also the micro social processes that operate in interpersonal interaction. The term racial, racialization tends to designate theories of racism as a macro level historical process. Racial, race, race, <laughs> racialization, sorry, is the process of constructing racial meaning, including the creation of racial categories and the, and the signification of these categories in relation to people, objects, and ideas. So, 
to racialize something, the focus on the constructedness of racial means shift analytic attention away from the content of racism and toward the individuals, groups, and social forces constructing and signifying race. The increasing focus of, on racialization as a process is part of the growing um, focus on uncovering general social processes and mechanisms. Indeed, research on racialization has revealed fundamental processes and mechanisms that contribute to the persistence of system-wide racial inequalities. Um, and that categorizes and define and distributes resources to groups at the macro level. So for example, what the Census Bureau, the United States Census Bureau that happens, what is it, every 10 years? Every 10 years classifies race as the following. So white is a person having origins in any of the original peoples of Europe, the Middle East, or North Africa. That's white. Okay, so Black or African American is a person having origins in any of the Black racial groups of Africa. Hmm. <laughs> it just doesn't make sense. So then there's American Indian or Alaska Native is a person having origins in any of the original peoples of North and South America, including Central America, and who maintains tribal affiliation or community attachment. There's Asian is people who have origins of any of the original peoples of the Far East, Southeast Asia, or the Indian subcontinent. Um, including places like China, Cambodia, Malaysia, Pakistan, the Philippine Islands, Thailand, Vietnam. Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander is a person who has or their original peoples are from Hawaii, Guam, Samoa, or other Pacific Islands. The Census Bureau does not consider people who identify their origin as Hispanic or Latino its own individual race. They, the Bureau considers this as an ethnicity, and people who identify their origin as Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish may be um, of any of the listed race that they choose. Um, and it's also can be a bias on how resources are distributed and how policies are developed for people of color. So there was a story a little while back um, that I was listening. I don't know if everybody listens to NPR, <laughs> and it is a um, show on NPR um, that deals specifically with race. And they were talking about in Puerto Rico with the United States Census um, that was being listed and how people in Puerto Rico will define themselves or describe themselves as being white. And so the resources that Puerto Rico needs for services and healthcare is not given to Puerto Rico because they are listing themselves as white um, and the funding is not going towards things that are needed. Next slide, please. So there's this, you know, white supremacy culture. We hear about it a lot, um, which is this idea of perfectionism and a sense of urgency, defensiveness, um, worship of the written word, only one right way of thinking, um, power hoarding, I'm the bigger one, the sense of individualism, um, objectivity, the right to comfort. And we see that a lot when it comes to how mental health is handled in this country. Um, the idea of um, there's just one way of doing something. Um, there is this idea of you think about it this way or else. Um, there's this idea that, there, that white is standard. Um, and even when I see clients, I'll mention something like, what is a healthy relationship? And I'll say to them, healthy relationship is how you define it because we have these ideas of what is healthy what is good um and that comes from white supremacy culture next slide please so the reform of medical providers um we cannot continue to be silent right and don't just signal the support root out racism in your workplace um, I work in public health <laughs> and I worked with Dr. Melu for a while and this was something that was always on the table um, and it was basically it could be things like pronouncing your name correctly and making sure people pronounce your name correctly, calling out those microaggressions and it was important to me in that workspace to be able to root it out to call it out because 
the funding that we were granted that was used for um, to help black and brown communities. Um, it's just important for people to be on the same page about those things. Um, and so you can't be stomping around the workplace being microaggressive to your coworkers, but yet you are um, funded to uh, disseminate resources to those communities, right? So there are things like that. Then there's to hold conversations to bring awareness to races at, racism at work and to create safe spaces where people can share their experiences openly um, because you know everything looks <laughs> different for some um, and also bringing those people to the table who have um, experiences um, with that culture or being a part of that culture. I've worked in several places where they will implement um, programs for black people but there hasn't been one black person at the table who can share um, that this is going to work or this is not going to work. And there have been plenty of times where programs have been implemented. Where I'm like, who came up with that? That is never going to work. And sure enough, it does not work because they did not have Black people sitting there at the table um, to roll things out or to, th to think about it critically, right? So um, lead the way on anti-racist efforts while learning from your own. May move into action swiftly to examine and dismantle racist and sexist practices embedded in all business functions and position the right to fight to, to, fight to end systemic racism as an ongoing effort that you are committed to in the long run to make some real change. Next slide, please. So we were talking yesterday um, about this alternative to behavioral health crisis. And I know we're kind of going back and forth, but there's so much and we only have so much limited time. So forgive us for just kind of feeling like it's going um, at a fast pace, but um, we've seen um, in recent time, not so recent time that the police are called sometimes the behavioral health crisis. Um, and there has been this shift that's happened that is who can we call besides the police to get um, folks adequate care, right? So there's this shift from police to community responses. So we've noticed that there's been ill-equipped police officers. So in a year, more than 240 million calls are made to 911. And police officers are the first responders to the scenes of everything from a crime to mental illness, to homelessness, to substance abuse. And this is demonstrated by the disproportionate numbers of people with mental illness with um, and substance use orders that are killed by police every year and the disproportionate numbers held in protective custody, right? So some police officers are trained to de-escalate situation. We've seen them use it in many situations and then sometimes they forget um, about how to use those skills in other instances. So some police officers have the skills, however, black community and community communities of color are historically characterized by tension and distrust when we see officers um, and this can lead to our feelings of distress and it can escalate mental health related situations. Um, the community shift has happened. There are some communities in the United States that have shifted away from the police led responses by reducing their environment, their involvement. For example, there's communities in Eugene, Oregon, Olympia, Washington and Phoenix, Arizona that are working to reduce the number of crisis calls directed to police. Um, the approaches to this have been <laughs> multi-layered. There are police-based responses that are crisis intervention teams and case management teams. And this is where police officers receive a specialized training to respond to mental health crisis and using multidisciplinary teams. And what that looks like is police, mental health clinicians, that could be psychologists, psychiatrists, um, therapists that go out and work together. 
Um, there are police-based co-responses, and this is where clinicians ride with police officers or where they can be available via phone or telehealth support. And there's community-based responses, which completely removes this idea of policing when it comes to behavioral health. And this includes crisis and warm lines, peer navigator programs, mobile crisis teams, and 911 diversion programs. Um, to recruit personnel in this way, people might think it's expensive, but you should pay people what they're worth, that's one thing. And then it's also important to identify team members who are passionate about serving people with mental health conditions. So there's no need for a graduate degree for this. It can simply be where there is this model of community. So, um, cultural brokerage, that's what it used to be called, where you have people from the community that are passionate about serving their community who have a care and a touch and an understanding for folks with mental health conditions, right? So some key considerations of this is that it takes funding. And we hear, we, I was on that discussion a few sessions ago with Pubholics where it was defunding the police and it turned into a lot of different things. But the fact of the matter is, is if, we're, if we are going to defund police, that means that funds are reallocated in positions of mental health crises. Um, and, and reallocating funds means that that police department budget would be slashed to, to move to this model, to pay those clinicians, to pay those community members to go out um, and help people with, um, with those mental health or behavioral health crisis, right? Um, I know here in Sacramento where I live, our police budget is ridiculous. There are tanks that were purchased, like tanks, like that you would see on army fields or battlefields. Um, that we've paid for with tax dollars. What do we need a tank for in Sacramento? That money that was spent, those multi-million or hundred million dollars could be used to reallocate to folks who are, um, who are suffering with mental health disorders and their families are calling for help or et cetera. Um, this also can take state grants public safety levies that are specifically carved out for funding um, to enhance non-police crisis response. Um, and then also really quick, in order to not call the police sometimes, sometimes there are some emergency mental health resources, but I know for me as a, as a clinician and on my, on my, um, my voicemail, and you'll hear like when you call the doctors and they'll say if you have a mental health crisis call 911, right? Like, no, I don't have that on mine. <laughs> mine says like, here are some urgent mental health resources. You can call the county of Sacramento. Um, there's crisis lines that you can call. There are, if you're not in crisis, you can call 211 or whatever you may have in your area. There's Turning Point, um, there's National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. You know, if you're in crisis and you're having suicide, suicide ideations, um, there are these different prevention lines. Um, so I put that on my voicemail and that might sound like a dissertation, but um, if there is a way that we can uh, eliminate folks being killed and maimed um, for having a crisis, I would rather have the dissertation than to put call 911 on my um, voicemail. So um, next slide, please. I think we're done. Yeah, so thank you. <laughs> um, our information is there. There's a, you can send an email to that info at uh, bwhwc.org. And then our website is there as well. Jessica, do you have anything to conclude? No, thank, thank you all so much. We're looking forward to the discussion and your questions. Thank you. Dr. Amelie, would you like to say anything? Uh, thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Joko, for covering this topic. There are so many topics you guys covered that was amazing. Uh, you talked about the uh, wealth inequalities currently as we speak. Uh, African-American wealth or Black wealth is 60% lower than a white counterpart. That's none. The evidence is there. Uh, we can share the resources in public. Uh, when you talk about soundness as well, 
you know, the, the issue about mental health abuse versus abuser goes to me personally, I look at it two ways. And I look at it two ways in the sense that if you look for Africa, for example, when you were talking about sadness, I just thought about it like, okay, when I was growing up in Africa, the stories I hear is like Africans that are captured to America are not just regular Africans. They capture warriors, you know, warriors that are supposed to be building Africa out of Africa. So what is that depletion? How does this work? You know, when you have all these warriors out of Africa and they come to America. So there's the issue about racism is a relevant issue today in terms of dealing with mental health or as a result of uh, uh, increase in mental health uh, in, within African-American or other uh, popular minorities as well. But also I need to say that when we talk about this mental health, we need to find a common ground where we can say, okay, this, all this event had happened. How do we move forward from there? And that's another thing we need to discuss. And there's something else I needed to show, but I will first hand it over to uh, Dr. Headley uh, to lead us into the uh, open discussion. Thank you, Dr. Amalu. I really appreciate this um, presentation. I mean, you gave us a lot of intricate um, historical basis um, for um, racism as a social determinant of mental health. And I really wholeheartedly appreciate it. And I will reach out to you uh, ladies later because you did also indicate a lot of good resources um, for people that are suffering from mental health. And we would like to share that on our website or um, maybe a link to, if you have it on your organization page, a link to your website um, for the people to reach out and get more information. Um, with that said, uh, we would now like to open up our forum. I'll stop sharing the slides in a few minutes or a few seconds actually, um, and have um, everyone engage in a healthy discussion on this topic. Um, with that said, I will stop sharing and we will- Hold on, Hold on Dr. Headley. If you're gonna stop, let me uh, quickly say something about two slides and then we can just leave it at that. Okay, hold on one second. Back. Okay, um, let me see. Okay, proceed. So before we go into open discussion, I want everybody to look at this slide. So what I did was I went to uh, Ask Cheese, which is a California health interview survey. And there they have a subjective survey that they send out to over 33 million uh, Californians and ask the question about one question about mental health. Remember, there's multiple ways you can assess mental health. So in this case, they as likely has had serious psychological distress during past year 2019. And this uh, survey is 2019 as cheese. So if you look at this, you can see the, the that, you know, Asian here has uh, the lowest, followed by black, African-American, then followed by white. And then you look at uh, East races and then Latino ethnicity, and you look at uh, native um, Pacific Islanders or native Hawaiian, and of course, uh, American Indian. American Indian and native Hawaiian are unstable, you know, so now what is happening here among blacks, you know, is it possibly because of stigmatization that most people don't want to admit that probably they have had a serious psychological uh, crisis. So next slide, please. When you look at this next slide, you have to look at the trend, the same question. So when we look at the trend since 2019, again, remember this is only in California. From 2019, those that said that they have not uh, had uh, serious uh, psychological distress during past year for the 2019 uh, Ask Cheese uh, survey are declining. So we're supposed to be going up, which is a healthy people, right? But it's actually going down since 2019 to 
2015 to 2019. And if you switch to asking them, likely has had serious psychological stress during the past year, it actually has been spiking up since 2019. So, you know, so uh, just this is the information I wanted to share just to see what is going on in California and why is this trend happening? Okay, that's it. Thank you for that, Dr. Amalu. And I would be curious to see in other areas and encourage everyone to check out your locale to see, um, you know, the variations and, and that, those type of um, things. Um, um, now we're opening it up. Um, let's see, I think uh, I'll start with the uh, comments in the chat and then we'll move forward. And, and I know that um, uh, Mr. Rodney had um, also wanted to comment. So, um, well, this is one of his comments. He said, uh, given the indigenous Native Americans and Japanese Americans receive reparations versus African-American Blacks, please speak on what are the differences, if appropriate, for this discussion. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the distinct differences is that we never received that. Um, at all. We, I don't even think we've received a proper apology from the United States on our, you know, even acknowledging, you know, they're, they're, they're really making an effort to try to wash away that history. And, and in fact, you know, I think there was a lot more support for the South after they lost the Civil War um, to really help rebuild their economy. And, and that's why um, when folks try to say the Civil War was about state rights and, you know, it was really about enslavement. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, the, 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 the distinct differences and I, you know, with Native Americans, I, you know, they, they have tremendous health inequities as well, too. So even though they might have received somewhat of a reparation, they also were very, they were displaced, they suffered through genocide. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think for us, we've never received it. And so I think, you know, for what I see is the, the misconception from a lot of people um, is not understanding how much our ancestors fought to even just get the right civil rights, right? And having some, you know, um, you know, oftentimes we'll hear us being compared to like Asian Americans, right? And say, well, they mobilize and, you know, they, you know, they support each other and, you know, but what we don't understand is that they have an entire government uh, and, and Chinese government to actually um, negotiate with the United States government as well too about how their people were treated as you can see. Um, you know, we have now a legislation for anti-Asian violence, uh, against anti-Asian violence, but we can barely get a, a legislation passed about anti-lynching laws. And so, you know, I think there are some very distinct, the very distinct differences on us not receiving that reparations. And even though, you know, like I said, the illusion is that some of us have made it, um, we are, you know, 400 plus years uh, of not having, um, uh, that being rectified for us. We should be getting, in my opinion, not pay taxes for the rest of our lives. <laughs> we should have free education, you know, like there should just be a lot of things to really help us build that, that generational wealth that we did not have access to. And as I mentioned to you, a lot of these plantation owners, you know, they had wealth. They were able to build wealth off of the backs of Black enslaved, uh, and enslaved people. Um, and so, yeah, I think that would be the distinct difference is that we never received one. We don't even, we, and there's oftentimes this uh, downplaying this experience. And I will hear people say, well, slavery happened however many years ago, but they forget about reconstruction. You know, there's, there's the red summer of 1919 where there was mobs of white people slaughtering black African-Americans in this country. There's Jim Crow, there's the civil rights um, movement. So, you know, these things are not just a thousand years ago. They're very real for us that, you know, they've happened to, you know, my grandmother, my mother, you know, I can go down the line of how our family has been distraught and have been displaced due to racism. So I would say that would be the difference. Thank you for that. Um, another question was, given, recent um, given the recent statement regarding America racism and black folks, how might the mental health inequities be used to combat these false forms of denial regarding racism here, particularly as applied to African-Americans? And they said that's by Kamala Harris. Yeah. 
<laughs> I couldn't even contain my face. I, you know, I'm very proud of the advancements uh, of leadership that we've had in this country. However, I think that there has just been this very visual disconnect, right? Like there's times where, there are times where folks will campaign on the backs of of black people but then when they get to where they're going they they forget like wh like who got them there and like how there was the support so it's interesting that i i heard this i heard i heard the quote i saw her say it so it's not like something that wasn't said i i saw it with my own eyes i heard it with my own ears and the the thing is is that there are these like i'll see i'll see clients come in and they're they're questioning their experience right so like when when things about racism come up at work they're questioning the fact that it even happened and it's because there are people saying we, we we've had barack obama as our president you know there is i'm the vice president and racism doesn't exist it happened a long time ago but like Jessica said these are been, this is a perpetual stain in our society. And the fact of the matter is that they can't recognize or apologize or just pay attention to it um, to even acknowledge that that stain is still there, right? So I see it all the time um, in mental health where they are saying, you know, maybe we get more black clinicians um that could provide mental health services sure it's good to connect with somebody that's that looks like you um but i think what it is is that mental health needs to do a better job with acknowledging the fact that it doesn't look the same for everybody um that our experiences are not the same that racism has been real and there are things like lobotomies that have happened like there are all these things that need to take place to get people to trust, to get us to trust the system. So even me being black as a clinician, there are people that will come to me and be like, yeah, but you you came from that white system. Yeah, that's true. But let me tell you, like, I'm a black person. I see you, you see me, let's go, let's get to work, that, that type of thing. Um, and so it's very, very interesting uh, when I heard that because it means that not only is the United States in denial, but that's internalized stuff that we have too, where we're in denial as well. Thank you for that. And then there was a statement made uh, to Pavholic saying that um, they think that we should reach out to policymakers in Sacramento um, to upcoming events. Um, and that was it on that. And um, just to um, add to that, that, that that's not it's not that it's not a possibility that would take some collaboration and papal will look into that and thank you for that um and i was just going to if mm -hmm. i could add to what shioka was saying just for the comment before um the data shows that racism is very real i mean so if we have to go from a data perspective we, we we've had several police killings of unarmed black people in the last couple of weeks so, you know, I, I think even with the vice president making that statement is very dismissive of um, the protesters, the, you know, the families who have been victims of, of uh, police and anti-Black violence. Um, so, you know, I, you know, the, I, I oftentimes, I really don't like saying that Black people are resilient because I think that dehumanizes us. We have been surviving in this nightmare. Uh, we've been doing the best that we can. And I think, you know, to Chioko's point, we not only need repre repre uh, representation of clinicians that understand that, but we also need them to be impactful because very much so, um, you know, there are Black people that can also internalize and, and uh, you know, implement anti-Black ideology as well, um, even on their clients because of being, being brainwashed into thinking some of us have made it. Um, so it's it's racism doesn't exist, and that that is that is absolutely not true. Laura, I just wanted to add to that. Yeah, thank, thank you. you for that. Are there any? I um, think. Uh, oh, okay. Go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, Robert is trying to say something. Robert Kendrick. Uh, 
I don't know. No, he's on mute. He's not talking, but oh, okay. I was going to open you it up and ask, is there anybody, any, would anyone else like to comment, um, give their thoughts? And if so, you may unmute first. Yes, uh, Robert Kendrick would like to speak. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I sorry. Didn't... <laughs> He's more intu intuitive than you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice <Okay>. jab. Um, <laughs> but anyway, go ahead. <laughs> He's a regular participant, yeah. so he gets those rights. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. Um, I I've been listening, and I understand the systematic racism um, and separatism back in um, slavery and how it, it has affected people, uh, uh, well, black people um, for um, mental health issues. And, um, and I'm just talking based on mental health issues. Um, but I also understand too, because I was born in the fifties that I've gone through the, the maturation of understanding that uh, brown people, uh, what we would say Latinos, um, Mexicans, et cetera, the cartels, they were filtering in drugs during, this, uh, during the 60s, 70s. Um, and well, with the help of the government, um, the mafia, et cetera. Um, but in the black communities, because of their social economical status, a lot of the black uh, blacks were, um, how would we say, um, helping by filtering these drugs to the black communities for personal wealth. How do you do you um, do you think that they're fi they're filtering these drugs and affecting in their mental health? Uh, status um, of the black community um, contributed to a lot of the mental health problems that black that black people have today. And if it, if you believe that, then um, do you also believe that that may be one of the reasons why reparations is is a sore issue with um, with society. Yeah, thank you for that that question. Um, I, it's, uh, I want to make sure we uh, I process it and respond. But you know, um, yes, I understand. You know, the war on drugs happened and started in the in the nineteen sixties with Nixon. You know, really being that law and order president. Um, but what I would say to that is, um, you know, even though there are Black African American people participating in that. The, the consequences for them were very severe compared to brown or mob people or whatever. I mean, if you look at the prison system for very low level drug crimes, um, African-Americans were sentenced at astronomical rate, rates and longer sentencing to really help again, kind of transform slavery into mass incarceration. Um, so, so while uh, I can say, you know, that is a vice that black people, you know, blacks and black communities took upon themselves to participate in. I would also say, offer this too. Um, there has not been a situation where we have been able to sustain uh, economic stability and um, be able to have thriving communities without one <laughs> them being burned down by by white mobs as they were in the summer of 1919. Um, or even thinking about, you know. I, I would argue to you, you know, for that person who's interested in, in you know, um, selling drugs to their community, if, if so, you know, a lot of the times, what other options, and it, they, it may be misinformed, but what other options would they would they have when you have a system that is structured by white supremacy, um, where the economic instability of communities exists, even, even in the 1950s? And you know, oftentimes I'll hear people say, well, the, the drug epidemic is when we start losing our families. And that's not actually true. We, start, we, we had our families dismantled since we got in this country. And that just continued on in different types of iterations of, of how they were, or how this country has really tried to 
profit off of our labor. And so, um, you know, I understand, and like I said, I, you know, we, we can talk about also, you know, gain activity in certain communities and why that happens. But to me that as a, as a mental health provider, that actually shows me and proves to me the trauma that has happened because of slavery, that post-traumatic stress and slave syndrome that has impacted people's decisions um, and impacted how we be are put into a community and also impacted this ideology of anti-blackness and devaluing black life. Um, and I, you know, that happens in, in a lot of different communities and it, it's rooted in white supremacy and our oppression and thinking that the only way that we can survive in this country is to use the master's tools or to um, do illegal things that can try to, you know, um, you know, care for our families or this individualistic uh, ideology that, you know, has been put on us when it comes to survival. Um, and so, yeah, you know, those things do impact us. And I would say there's, there's some deeper root causes to why these drugs were placed in Black communities purposely to really dismantle, you know, the Black Panther and civil rights movement and to really just, you know, criminalize us into um, making Black uh, advancement movements into um, terrorist, terrorist movements. As you, as you may know, they listed Black Panthers as a terrorist group of yeah. FBI, uh, but not the Klan who burned down a church with four little girls. So um, I would just say like there's, 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 there's levels to it. And I think for me, I'm always going to try to uh, un unpack the the glacier underneath or sorry the iceberg underneath the glacier if that makes sense for black people because you know I have to ask myself would these things have happened in the civil rights era and in the 80s had we had not been enslaved and had we had been given our reparations for the trauma and the terror that was bestowed upon us and as we first entered in this country right and I just think we are you know the reactions are really um, hidden traumas, generational traumas that have been placed on us through trying to survive in this in this nightmare. Yeah, I, I mean, I just wanted to add really quick, like you mentioned about like the drugs having, well, these aren't, these weren't your exact words, but it was the drugs maybe having some effect on the mental health, like so the use of drugs, right? Um, and I thought that was interesting too, and that was a great point, is that yeah, there have been a lot of people who have, who a lot of black folks who got on drugs, you know, 80s, 70s, 60s, you know, they're returning back from war without the same level of care and the same level of um, mental health services, right? And so, you know, I, my grandfather served in Korea and, you know, just something it wasn't talked about as far as, but I can remember being a little girl and him, waking up like with night terrors right so now as an adult i'm like oh my gosh that's what was happening to him is that he would shout out and then you'd be like oh grandpa and you're like oh i'm so sorry i'm so sorry i was i was dreaming about something real good something like that but my grandfather and his brothers they turned to alcohol right because they're they're experiencing so not only are you experiencing something in another country <laughs> that was unseen like things that you just wouldn't see on your own but they're fighting the system of racism and discrimination in another country and then they're coming home and they are not celebrated as soldiers and protectors they're still seen as uh as black men who are less than they weren't getting the same va privileges as the people that walked alongside them in war um and so I saw it as a kid and as an adult with, you know, my great uncles and my grandfather as far as alcoholism, but in, you know, but it makes sense. It's not the way, but at that time, what else are we supposed to do? And so you have this residual effect of people who are turning to substances to numb right now. So right now it's a huge thing with marijuana and marijuana lace things or whatever. And I, I won't go all into that, but you're seeing the same thing as hopelessness and not being able to get as far as your peers that have the same level as education or experience or whatever. Um, and it's, it's numbing, so, yeah. And to, and to Shioko's point, a lot of those veterans, sorry, were being lynched. So, you know, I can only imagine what that looks like trying to, you know, um, fight for your country 
strive to have this American dream and then coming back home and being lynched by white moms. Um, you know, and, I, and yeah, and, and just to, you know, Chioko's point, that trauma, and as I had mentioned to you all earlier, what other hospital options or mental health services were available, especially in the 1950s and 60s? It was segregated hospitals where, you know, if you wanted to get treatment, you had to consent to being experimented on. Um, so as Chioko was saying, sorry, you're going to figure out other vices to use to cope with the trauma. And so, you know, and then also, again, I, I can't I can't stress enough, you know, how we were criminalized and put in prison for very low level drug crimes. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Can I, can I jump in? Sure. Great. Um, you know, I wanted to thank uh, Sister Brown, Sister Grievous, and also Brother Kendrick. You know, I was born and raised in the Fillmore uh, during the 60s, so I was fortunate enough to attend some of the earliest alternative schools in the Fillmore of San Francisco, knew personally Huey P. Newton. And the reason why I bring his name up, I'm sure that most, if not all of you are familiar with who he was or what have you. But as it relates to this discussion and the influx of drugs that hit primarily African-American uh, communities early on, the irony to me is that um, according to the reports that I had, um, uh, Huey P. Newton, ultimately was shot and killed allegedly by a drug dealer. Um, and so I, I just wanted to add that, but my main question goes back to the social determinant. That is the four levels that were mentioned, the structural, institutional, interpersonal, um, and one other that I've forgotten. My question is this, in relation to structural no uh, racism for a group or individuals that would seek to assist in the dismantling of these institutions, would you say that those should be the primary targets or what? That's the crux of my question. And, and are you talking about like the people that created these, these structural, yeah. the structure? No, I meant, okay, uh, understanding that these are structures that, that have been in place and have uh, grown over time. That is those who are interested in dismantling these uh, racist uh, institutions or racist uh, structures. The way, like, okay, for example, the way I see it, I think all four of those levels influence racism in America, especially as it's imposed against African Americans and as it relates to mental health. But if I had to just kind of make an, I guess, an educated guess, I would assume that the ones that today show the strongest impact on racism and as it's manifested through uh, mental health issues as they affect in particular African-Americans or black folks here would be structural and institutional uh, racist structures. So for those who would like to assist in the dismantling, whether they are part of those institutions or or not, would those be the ones to focus on or should it be another one? I'm hoping my question is clear, perhaps not. Yeah, and, and I can give you what my my opinion is, because um, you know I, I I think this is as I had mentioned to you, it, it's a it's a four hundred plus year um, dismantling, right? I, I think for me, if we really wanted to dismantle this structure, I'm gonna be brave and say this: we would have to redo everything, our constitution, our ideas of democracy, all of that would have to re, re, be done. We'd have to 
get away with it and rebuild it again. Because all of those ideologies and those concepts were contradictory. You know, some of our founding, what they call the founding fathers, were talking about freedom and equal rights for all men, yet they had slaves. Um, so I think as far as that goes, it, we would have to really restructure um, our entire system. But that's a that's a pipe dream for me. So so you know what we do now is though we need people to be educated on the history. I think there's too many people that don't understand the actual history and the way that the ways in which anti-blackness has been formed and has been really brainwashed in all of us. You know, and how we how we see whiteness as power, authority, and 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 right. Um, compared to how we see blackness. And so we need to really, I mean, those that want to participate, I think they do need to educate themselves on the structures and the impacts of racism in order to really be on the same page. And as Shioko mentioned later, when we're talking about healthcare, um, it's going to be really just decolonizing how we provide mental health services, um, thinking about culturally congruent practices that we can use that are in partnership with communities. Um, and not just, you know, taking Black history and saying, I got it, but really it has to be a really day-to-day -day approach to how do I, and this is why Shioko said, it will probably be important for those that are non-Black identified to read how to be an anti-racist, because Dr. Kendi goes through that on an interpersonal level, how people can really unpack their own biases, because the thing that's been happening and what I'm seeing now is um, we're having younger policymakers not not address racism. You all probably saw the debate between um, the the Republican Senate, I think, uh, where he's trying to put in these voter suppression laws that were done back in the 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 fifties <laughs> uh, and sixties. And so people, we're repeating our history because we don't understand it, and we're trying to dismantle it. So I, I think for me, and I know that's. That's, that's not answering all your question, but to me, the first start would be for people to really educate themselves on the history and understand the ways in which that white supremacy has really brainwashed us into um, being anti-black, even amongst our own community. Um, so to me, that would be that would be the start for someone that wants to help with dismantling this thing and then really looking at the policies that have been put in place and how to lead with an anti-racist racial equity lens when you're in these these institutions that are implementing policies that impact people of color. Um, so I think, I don't know, Chioko, you want to add into it, but those those would be my first two steps on a long list of things that we would need to do to start with uh, dismantling these things. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Jessica. Uh, and thank you, Rodney, for asking that question. Because when you were asking the question, something came you know, to my mind and thinking. We're now talking about a mental health as uh, uh, unidirectional, right? Like the the we're not talking about the abuser. We are talking about the abuse, you know. But I also agree with uh, Jessica that uh, this is uh, we all have biases. And when I look at uh, mental health in a lens, I look at it as biases. And now, based on the question you just asked, if I look at it as spatial temporal meaning you're looking at the causation of things that happen before the outcome happened, right? I can see that slavery and the impact it had on African-American. But think about it this way. The person actually making the policies of slavery and all that thing, we need to look at their mental health acuity and see are they really meant, you know, like, because you look at Hitler, for example, Right. So when you look at this mental health that we are talking about now, focusing on black, we need to go back as well. Look at all these policies. This, like you say, so, uh, our founding fathers are slave owners. You know, yet you say we are all created by the same God and all that stuff. So we need to look at it uh, 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 bi-directional. We look at the the, the abuser and look at the mental health. What trauma has this abuser has gone through to be able to come out with this type of weird uh, policies that torture the other group? You see what I mean? So the mental health issue goes across the board. It goes, goes bi-directional. And yeah. there's a lot of work we need to do about this because the abuser may have gone through some mental health issue uh, there's no excuse for the abuser's mental health issue that 
led to this, but also the abuse is going through a mental health issue, which is a uh, special temporal after the fact. Well, and you're, you're hitting it right on the nail because I and I'm sorry, Chick, I uh, didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, because what we have to understand too is how the impacts of racism on all of us, but just to your point, what in the psyche can allow someone to see someone be lynched, be raped, um, and you to go on in your daily night lives as if nothing happened? You know, when the Black Lives Matter movement is happening and we, we are seeing these public execution, and oftentimes I'm talking to white identified people about it, and they can't empathize with why Black people are, are upset, are hardened, are not hardened, but disheartened and, and sad about these things. That to me is sociopathic, that you have gone through the 400 years of having whiteness um, be catered to, having the privilege, um, and you lack the empathy, to, but you, you'll have the empathy for the dog. If you see a dog get hit by a car, there's cries and tears and protests. But when you see human life be taken, there's a, there's a disconnect from that. And so you're absolutely right. We do need to look at the other side of it too. And I, and I would offer for, for those that are you know, black identified to understand, of course we would have trauma. Of course we would be depressed. Of course we would be anybody in this circumstance would have those things. And so I think what I, I, my mission is to really help black people not internalize, like this is not you, right? And then to your point, yes, there needs to be some, some soul searching on the other side of why you need to stand on somebody else to be higher up. You know, and Toni Morrison says this beautifully, what, a, what is it about you where you have to stand on my back to feel um, valued, right? That that's something. There's something going on there. So right. you're, right. you're on it with that. There's, there's a whole other side of where we need to understand um, how how white people have been socialized to devalue life, really through the, the enslavement of Black African American people in this country. So thank you for saying that. Sorry, Shioka. No, no, no. I, I mean, I, I couldn't have said it better. It, it is, it is this, it's really, it's just really, really interesting. Um, I, I know we were talking about a little bit ago about people getting involved in the work and, and what you need to have to get involved with the work. So if you're, if you're interested in dismantling or eradicating like health disparities, right? Like, what do you need to have in place? It's an understanding for what has happened, understanding for the history, right. understanding for people and their needs and the circumstances. But like what I keep saying is I've said at many or I haven't been at many tables, been like in the next room or something. And you will see, you will hear these things that come out and you're just, and there are people who are in public health who don't have that understanding of race, classism, um, the history of, of community p policing or community policies, and they're just creating stuff. And you're just like, where did that come from? But it's this idea of, I don't need to ask. I already know. I've been in charge this whole time. I know, I know what needs to happen. I know what needs to, what needs to be done. And it is, it's bewildering to me. And, and you're right. I've been in going to work after something like George Floyd or Philando Castile or Breonna Taylor or the list goes on and on and on. And people around you are just conducting themselves like normal. And then you'll look at the, in the eyes of another black person or black identified person and you can just see the sorrow, but it's not spoken. It's like business as usual. There's been times where I've been on a call like after George Floyd, and I got a call from a manager afterwards, like, oh, you seem so down today. What's, are you okay? And it's like, so I'm supposed to shuck and jive for you after a death of somebody that I saw on TV, you saw the same thing. So it is very, it's disturbing. Um, and I always tell people, like, even when we were waiting for that bird to come back, and I was asked, I was telling clients the night before, you need to take care of yourself the best way possible. If it, if you are in a position where you can take the day off, take the day off. You have to, we have to start 
taking care of ourselves and healing ourselves because no one is going to let us do it or allow us to do it. But we need to start taking that that power that we can to take care of ourselves and to speak out like you didn't see what happened last night. That's not disturbing to you. So it's to call those things out all the time. Yeah, thank you, um, um, Chiyoko, for that. And then Jessica, for your contributions to this um, forum. Um, I, I, again, this is on my list with defund the police. We could talk forever and we have proven that today on our Mother's Day <laughs> special, but it was well worth it. I don't, I hate to leave people out, but as always, because uh, we are two hours in, I would um, welcome any comments, questions to info at pubholic.org and you know we're really good about getting back to everyone. Um, we include everybody who attends, uh, registers, we don't care. It's information that we believe is important and needs to be read or heard. So with that said, I any last comments, quick comments before I, I don't want to be rude. I just want to I want to give everyone <laughs> after I tell you guys. Uh, all, I needed to, all I needed to say, please don't forget uh, June 8th, uh, June 5th, sorry, uh, Dr. Stoney Anderson, a well-known GI specialist. Daniel uh, known by Stone well. Daniel. Anderson. <laughs> Daniel Stoney Anderson will be presenting on colon cancer and screening. I have worked with uh, uh, this amazing doctor for uh, you know a few years. Uh, he will be presenting it. This is a discussion you will not want to miss because you're gonna get a lot of information about colon cancer and screening. So you don't want to miss this particular. Uh, discussion. He's well known even by the CDC and a lot of public health experts here in California. Yes, so that that this is that one is going to be um, a very good show. Um, so, um, but we'll send out. You know, you'll start seeing Papalic promoting and you know and so forth. Again, we thank you all for attending and engaging. Um, I, I wholeheartedly, I, I thank our presenters, um, Ms. Grievous and Ms. Brown. This was fantastic and a great way for me to kick off my Mother's Day. Um, so I thank you for that um, and adding value to my, my life in general uh, with all the information. I might have some. Um, clarifying questions later down the road <laughs> that I'll, I'll email. Don't worry, I'll email. But um, again, thank you. Thank you for everyone who attended, engaging um, in this healthy discussion with healthy people. And we always tell you guys to go out. And as Ms. Grievous and Ms. Brown, don't just sit here and take this information. Let's do something about it. And we can take baby steps within our communities your workplace and so forth to disseminate good information and valuable information, encourage others to do the same. Um, we also like to um, also add, encourage people to attend our shows. Um, when we send you out um, our flyers and stuff, we ask that you um, also send them out to your colleagues and your relatives. Don't sit there and say, oh, I don't think this person would be interested. You just never know what they're looking for at that moment. So again, thank you and everyone have a blessed day and a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Chioko. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye.